given to us that sets us free. Our brother Mike with the messages from, from Micah, pointing to the hope we have in Christ and the eternal hope we have with him. And now we have another brother who has preached several times and we're blessed by it. And, and uh, uh, so I'm gonna call again our brother Russ to come and to share the word. May our ears and our hearts be open to it. So thank you, brother. It's always a tremendous uh, privilege, also a tremendous responsibility uh, to open the Word of God with God's people. Actually, to open the Word of God with any people, saved or lost, to make sure that we are uh, communicating, in fact, the Word, the very Word of the living God, and that it will accomplish the purpose to which uh, the Lord would send it forth. I often think of that verse of uh, John the Baptist where the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I don't believe John was the voice. Well, he was the voice, but the one that was crying was the Lord was crying in and through him. And the Lord uh, condescends in a sense to use human beings uh, to herald his word. And what a privilege that is. But before we look at our passage this evening, uh, let's just bow for another a word of prayer. And Lord, in a very uh, real sense, we uh, sit here this evening uh, around your table, uh, remembering your death, seating at the sit seating at uh, around the foot of the cross. And Lord, I thank you that your church, your people have been remembering you in this fashion. And Lord, we will continue to do so in the generations ahead until you come. And Lord, we thank you uh, that there is that coming day when uh, the clouds will burst open and, and the Son of the living God shall once again uh, uh, descend. And Lord, when we see you, we shall be like you, for we shall see you as you are. And Lord, we long for this day. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. And so, Lord, we pray and ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that your word would have that purifying effect in each of our hearts this evening. We ask it in his name. Amen. It's interesting, in the last several months, a number of speakers, preachers here, have made reference to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, uh, where the Apostle Paul says, For I determined uh, to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I thank God that uh, we didn't just simply tack uh, the communion service at the end of the service, but at the very beginning of the service. Uh, for he is the only celebrity, he is the only one uh, that we need to remember. But I remember Cecil Andrews when he preached from Northern Ireland through Zoom, how uh, he made reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. Uh, I think uh, Max did as well when he was preaching his messages on the glory of God, along with Keith Faulkner. And I'm sure I've heard uh, Mike uh, mention uh, that verse as well. And so I thought we would look at that tonight and probably next week as well. Uh, we would finish the message, but I've titled the message, The Christian's Soul Focus. And it's going to be at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. But I'm going to read from verse, verses 1 through 5. And this is the Apostle Paul uh, explaining to, to the Corinthians how he came to them. And he says in verse 1, And I, brethren... When I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. 
And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The pivot point of human history is what we have celebrated here this evening, is the cross of Jesus Christ, the one who died upon that cross and on the third day rose again uh, from the dead. And it is the very uh, thing that the world hates. The world absolutely hates the cross of Jesus Christ because a person must come and humble themselves before the cross. They come and recognize that our God and our Savior who became a man, he came into this world for one purpose was to go to the cross, to bear the penalty, to bear the sin of his people on that cross. And to recognize that his death was in my place, that I was the one who put him there, that it was my sin that he carried on the cross, that it was the filth and the ugliness of my life that he took upon himself, and that he was tortured there and hung there, and the sufferings of the cross are really seen, which we do not see at all, we'll never understand, when he cries out from the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the reason he was forsaken was so that I would never have to be forsaken. And he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. What a wonderful promise we have. And so Satan is always seeking to devalue the person of Jesus Christ. Satan is always seeking to devalue the work of Jesus Christ. That's what the cults are all about. That's what religion is all about. Biblical Christianity exalts the person and the work of Christ. And we see that Paul spent his life, once he met Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road, once he cried out to the Lord, Lord, what will you have me to do? From that moment on, he would spend the rest of his life exalting, promoting, uh, lifting up the name of Jesus Christ and the purpose and work for which he'd come into the world. You see, the conversion of Paul of Tarsus was the bar that was set. God was going to use Saul of Tarsus, who would become Paul, the great apostle, as the standard, as the pattern for what salvation is all about. First Timothy chapter uh, 1, we'll look at it later, uh, verse 16 tells us this. And I'm just simply going to give the outline, maybe with a few points. Uh, in the outline that I've given to you, centering in on verse 2 of chapter 2 in uh, 1 Corinthians. And he emphasizes five things in this, in this verse. The first thing we're going to look at is the Christian's crucified mindset. For I determined. This is what the Apostle Paul cries out. He says, I determined. He starts with a determination. You see, the Apostle Paul had made up his mind a deep, deep resolve in his soul. And he determined when he went to Corinth or when he went anywhere that he was going to go with one message, and that was the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is his sole focus. And that is to be the sole focus, I believe, of every Christian, of every Christian leader, of every Christian church. The sole focus is Jesus Christ and him crucified. To both sinner and saint. You see, just when we come to the cross and we are saved, we don't then turn our back and forget the cross. We figure it's done its work. No, no, the cross must become a part of the life of the believer. Even as Paul would cry out later on, and actually, I think it's in Galatians, for I am crucified with Christ. In other words, the life that Paul was living was a crucified life. He had been crucified together with Christ. But he says, nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not me who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. And Paul recognized that the risen Lord, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, who had been crucified, risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, 
was the same Jesus that had taken up residence by the person of God, the Holy Spirit, in his heart and life. And that's the life that he was living. It was his life, not his own. And he recognized that Jesus Christ loved him. Do you recognize that? Jesus Christ loves you. The God and the creator of the heavens and the earth and the one who hung upon that cross, he loves you. And that's the message he has given us to go into all the world. To simply say, Jesus Christ loves you. He died upon the cross. Come to the cross. Humble yourself. Confess your sin. Repent. Turn to him from your sin. And the second thing we're going to look at, we will see Paul's academic credentials. Oh, we're not going to talk about his worldly credentials, probably educated at the University of Tarsus. We know that he studied in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel. We know that he excelled above all of his contemporaries. But they weren't his educational or academic credentials. And so we're going to look at the Christian's radical schooling. He said, I determined not to know anything. Strange school. Not to know anything. A school where they taught you nothing. Nothing of this world's wisdom. As a matter of fact, the Bible has lots to say about nothing. Often I'll put that up on my sketchboard when I'm on a street. People love seeing statements like that. The Bible has lots to say about nothing. I got that when someone actually said that to me, a heckler. And I looked at him and I said, you're right. The Bible says that we came into the world with nothing. And when we go out of the world, we go out with nothing. The Bible says that there is nothing hidden which will not one day be made manifest. The Bible tells us that there's nothing to pay. To pay. There's nothing to do that Jesus Christ cries from the cross to tell us die. It is finished. The price has been paid. The scripture tells us that there is nothing to fear. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Nothing to fear. Oh, the Bible has lots to say about nothing. And that's the school that Paul went to when he met Jesus Christ. He forgot all about the world's wisdom. He forgot all about his secular education. And he started learning at the feet of Jesus. A complete and total change. Never has the church, and I use the word church very loosely, especially here in North America, had more books, more TV programs, radio, internet, endless resources. And never has the North American church been so anemic. Anemic. We are losing ground. I know that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And I believe that's true. But not all that glitters is gold. Not all that professes to be Christian, not all that professes to be a Christian church is in fact Christian. Many professors. But how many truly possess that which Paul is talking about here where he says, I determined to know nothing. We live in North America where we think that we are the standard. We think and we pretend to know everything. But you see, in the third world countries, where they have nothing of this world's goods, where they have not the resources that you and I have, they put us to shame. My mind immediately goes to the seven churches in Revelation. And I'm trying to think, I know it was Ephesus, what was the second, Smyrna. Oh, how the Lord loved the church. It's, well, he loved all the churches. And, but Smyrna was persecuted. They were suffering for their faith. And yet Jesus had nothing negative to say about the church in Smyrna. And you come to the church of Laodicea that had everything of this world. But Jesus says, you're blind, you're naked, you're destitute. 
And he tells them that they must go and, and, and seek after true gold and true wisdom, which we heard about this morning. And we're going to be looking at that pure heart or that determined mindset. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And you and I have the mind of Christ, which is the word of the living God. We'll be looking at that probably more so next week. And then the third thing we're going to look at, we're going to see Paul's surroundings when he lived in Corinth. He says, for I determined to know nothing where among you, in Corinth. And so here we're going to look at the Christian's offensive surroundings. Do you find your surroundings offensive these days? Do you listen to your, the news and find it very, very offensive? Do you find yourself grieved and vexed in your spirit with the things that you hear? I hope you do. We are living in a time of unprecedented times, I believe. Things are imploding upon us. I believe that God is speaking, but is man listening? And I believe he's just speaking now. Maybe he whispered at 9-11 and he's starting to speak now through uh, things like COVID. I, I believe worse things are coming. I'm not a prophet. But he will start shouting and he will send judgment. You see, we don't just simply believe the promises of God. We also believe the judgments of God that he has promised to send. And so we're going to look at the Christian's offensive surroundings. And so Paul is reflecting back to his time when he was among the Christians in Corinth. The Cor and Corinth was the world in microcosm. Corinth was the world in miniature. It was the New York City, so to speak, of their day. If you couldn't find it in Corinth, it couldn't be found anywhere. If you can't find it in New York City, it can't be found. And that's what Corinth was. And when we dig into that, uh, possibly next week, uh, we will see just how corrupt and evil and wicked and offensive the surroundings that Paul went into. He went in amongst them. I wonder what it was like for Jesus to come into this world. A very offensive sin sick world and yet he the only one who was pure comes into this world and he suffers and dies upon a cross and here we see paul crying out for i determined to know nothing among you in this offensive setting it was in that setting that i determined to know nothing among you except jesus christ and him crucified and that's what our offensive setting that we live in needs to hear jesus christ and him crucified that's all they need to hear they don't need our philosophy they don't need our psychology they don't need anything other than jesus christ and him crucified you say they'll laugh and mock of course they will but God is calling a people out of this world for his name's sake. Do you believe that? I hope you believe in the doctrine of election. That God has chosen a people from before the foundations of the world. And he has also elected the means whereby he is calling those people to himself. He sends his elect back into the world to call out to them. To come to him. My sheep will hear my voice. They heard the voice of the shepherd through Paul simply because he determined to know nothing among them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then fourthly, we're going to look at the Christian's satisfying subjection. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ. What controlled, dominated, and motivated and spurred Paul on was Jesus Christ. What motivates you? What motivates you in your life? As you start each day, is it Jesus Christ? Is he your sole focus? And do you wake up in the morning thinking of him? Regardless of what you do in life, regardless of what your calling is in life, Paul 
a servant called a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle. We are all servants of Jesus Christ. Whatever your calling is, but you're first and foremost a servant of Jesus Christ. And as a servant of Jesus Christ, we too must determine to know nothing among this offensive setting and surroundings that we live in except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You see, Paul was once a slave to sin. He was a slave to self, he was a slave to the world. But now we're going to see that Paul became a slave to Jesus Christ. You find that in Romans chapter six. He became an absolute slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. He did his bidding. On the Damascus road, Lord, what do you want me to do for you? Have you said that to the Lord? Have you recognized that Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, is your master? He is your Lord. Have you cried out from the heart, Lord, what would you have me to do? He didn't just save you for you. He saved you for him, for his honor and for his glory. And he has gifted you. He has given you gifts for you to serve him. And by serving him, his fellowship, his church, his people, and a lost and a dying world are benefited by you exercising the gifting that he has given to you. If you've never cried out to the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? And if the Spirit of God would be convicting you even now, right from where you sit, just cry out to him. Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, I really do want to serve you. What would you have me to do? And it's not negotiable. God doesn't negotiate. He will show you. And then fifthly, we will see Paul's focal point and power or the Christian's sacred goal. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You see, Paul stopped at the cross. The cross was his end in view. His goal always was to bring the sinner and the saint alike to the cross. And I'm sure people got tired of Paul. Paul, you're you're, you're a one message man. Well, no, he wasn't really. But the cross in the life of the believer or the cross set before the unsaved was always in the message of the apostle Paul. He couldn't get away from it. He met the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. And can you imagine when the Shekinah glory of God shone down upon him, knocks him off his horse. And I believe that Saul of Tarsus recognized that this had to have been the Shekinah glory of God. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And just like Moses asking the Lord, what is your name? Saul says, who are you, Lord? I know you're the Lord. What's your name? Ego Amy, Jesu. I am that I am, Jesus. The great I am from Exodus chapter 3 was now shining upon the apostle Paul, knocks him off his horse, and he recognizes that Jesus is the great I am from the Old Testament. Lord, what would you have me to do? What else could he say? And my friends, if you recognize that this very same Jesus is the one that has knocked you off your horse, so to speak, you can do nothing but cry out to him and say, oh Lord, what do you want me to do for you? You see, Paul gloried in the cross, and only in the cross. Galatians 6.14, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. And so I'll take a 
few more moments and possibly look at the first point. We'll pick up the other four points next week. But the five points are very simply the Christian's crucified mindset, the Christian's radical schooling, the Christian's offensive surroundings, the Christian's satisfying subjection, and the Christian's sacred goal. And now we look at the Christian's crucified mindset where the Apostle Paul cries out, for I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so I would say that as never before in the time and age in which God has called each one of us into the kingdom, you do realize that you've been called into the kingdom for such a time as this. This isn't by accident that you're here. He has called you specifically into his kingdom for such a time as this. Because he has special work for each and every one of us to do for such a time as this. He has you located in your place of work or schooling or wherever it is for such a time as this. But you have to have a determined mindset. The mind must be changed. This is serious. He has called us into the kingdom for such a time as this because it's a serious time that we are living in. It is a very serious time that we are living in. And just think, the God and the creator of the heavens and the earth, he chose to bring you into the world for this time, for this very time. Let that sink in. You're not just here. You're here on the king's business. Do, do you believe that? You are here on the king's business. And what a business it is. What a business it is. And so each one of us must make up our mind. We must, like the Apostle Paul, have this deep resolve in our soul. We must weigh the evidence. We must count the cost because there is a cost. There is a cost. And that's what Jesus was telling his disciples as he was training them, leading them on. He kept on pointing them to Calvary, he kept on pointing them to Jerusalem. They didn't want to hear that. And he kept on saying that they too must take up their cross. There is a cost. And I often tell people uh, that salvation is the most expensive free gift you'll ever receive. It costs you nothing to get be saved for Jesus paid it all. We sang about it. But it'll cost you everything. Don't you want to hear him say to you? And I could put, put your name in there, so and so. I called you into the kingdom for such a time that you were there. Well done, good and faithful servant. Isn't that what you want to hear? If you don't hear it, life was wor worthless. We must serve him. We must serve him. After all is said, and, is said and done, we must make up our mind once and for all. And like our master, we must set our face like a flint towards Jerusalem, towards Calvary. Listen to Matthew chapter 16. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Uh, don't you love Peter? Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine that, rebuking the Lord? And began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. Now, that's contradictory. How can he be calling Jesus Lord and he's rebuking him? Who's the Lord here? Who's the master? Who's the servant? This shall not happen to you, but he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. Can you imagine the meek and mild Jesus turn? Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. See, my friends, we have to recognize the hiss of the serpent. Not only in the sinner, not only in the devil, 
but in the saint. This was Peter, the great apostle Peter. And Satan is using him to seek to avoid the cross. And when the cross is preached to believers, the taking up of the cross and, and simply following Jesus, hmm, things change. People in the church just don't like hearing that. We'd rather have our comfort and everything's nice and pretty. We don't like the thought of maybe the world contending with us. Family contending, friends contending at the workplace. The writer of Hebrews says, let us go outside the camp and bear his reproach. And from Genesis to Revelation, it's amazing that the first person ever to die in the Bible died a martyr's death. The first man ever to die on planet Earth died a martyr's death. He died and went to heaven. Isn't that incredible? He died and went to heaven. Stephen, the first, the first martyr in the, in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the New Testament. And he sees Jesus standing. Lord Jesus, do not hold this sin against them. And he lays down his life for his testimony for the Lord. All he did was bear witness to what he saw and knew. It cost him his life. Ah, but what a life. What a death. Why waste a good death? And I'm not joking when I say that. We all got to die. I, I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't care how I go. Maybe I will when the time comes. I don't know. But I, I want to die in full battle dress. I, I want to die with the armor on and wielding the sword. Don't you? Oh, I've had so many examples pass on before me. And I said, oh, Lord, what a wonderful testimony. Checking out of this world, praising and worshiping you as they leave one life into the next. What a testimony. And so Calvary is the place of humiliation, shame, sorrow, pain, suffering. It's the place of death. But you see, the cross was always in the heart and the mind of God. The cross, in a sense, is the heart of God. You see, Jesus was crucified from before the foundation of the world. In an eternity past, before anything was even created, the cross was already in the heart and the mind of God. Think of that. Oh, don't avoid the cross. But this determination of mind will never take place, let alone last, unless it's resting on five foundation stones. I could spend an evening on each one of these foundation stones. I may just brush over them. I may take one or two, but each one is so powerful. And so the question I have for each one of you, you're going to think it's comical, but have you ever been conned? Have you ever been conned? Well, Paul was conned five times over. And each time he was, it set up another foundation stone enabling him to shout across the centuries that I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And the first foundation stone was the foundation stone of conviction. You see, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was convicted of sin by God, the Holy Spirit. On the Damascus road, the Lord would say, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. It was hard for you standing there watching Stephen lay down his life, the Spirit of God speaking to his heart. He came under great, great conviction and the convicting work of God, the Holy Spirit. Have you ever been conned? Has the Spirit of the living God ever convicted you of your sin? Well, I, I don't mean just sort of convicted in the sense that I know I've done wrong and 
I'm not as bad as that person there and not as good as I know I should be, but you know, everything will work out in the end. No, no. I'm talking about being convicted by God, the Holy Spirit. Oh, I always knew I was a sinner. But then in October of 1974, when the Spirit of God opened my eyes to the truth about me, that was altogether different. And I knew there was nothing I could do to change. I was conned by the Holy Spirit of God, convicted. Listen to the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, uh, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundantly uh, with faith, with exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering. And then he says this as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him. The apostle Paul, his salvation was a pattern for those who would come to the place of receiving faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 17, he just breaks out in a, in a doxology. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, Paul, God did something in Paul's life Paul experienced some, thing, some deep conviction of sin. John 16, verse 8 says this, and when he has come, referring to the Holy Spirit, he will convict. He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. The work of God, the Holy Spirit, when he was sent into the world, was to convict the world of sin of righteousness, and of judgment to come. The life and words of Jesus Christ reprove this world for its sin. In John chapter 7 and verse 7, he's saying to his brothers, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Why? Because I testify that its works are evil. Can the world hate you? Does the world hate you? Does the world and the offensive surroundings that you live in, does it hate you? Have you made enemies, not that you go out to make enemies, but because of your testimony and your life? Does it reprove the world in which you're living? Serious question. Over 100 years ago, William Booth said this, we will soon have in the church, and I would use the word church loosely, uh, but thousands of conversions, but not one of them being convicted of sin. Culturally acceptable Christianity, so-called, doesn't square with the Bible. We heard that this morning. Culture is changing. And the culture is saying that truth changes and right and wrong changes depending on how uh, the, the, the moral acceptance of the, of the culture in which we're living. If it doesn't offend the way it used to. As a matter of fact, many churches are embracing that which the world rejected 25, 30 years ago. Things are changing, but the word of God doesn't change. And if you've been convicted and you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then your spirit is vexed. And you are offended with the things that you see around you. And your life must testify against that because we are Christians. Our words must testify against that. Oh, but that could cost. Yes, it could. As a matter of fact, it will. 
But that's why you have to have a determined mindset. It must be determined. You, you must have thought through this. You must have counted the cost. And you are determined in your mind. We heard about a pure heart this morning. A pure mind. A pure mind is a determined mind. It's a mind that is filled with the word of the living God. It's the mind that is filled with the word of Christ. Let this word dwell, let this mind dwell in you richly, the scripture says. Len Wass, who was our head deacon at the church I was at in New York, probably about eight years ago now, at a men's ministry, he said, Russ, guys, he says, our Christianity seems to be coming moralistic, psychological deism. Why so little sin, why so little conviction of sin in the world today? I believe it's because there's so little conviction of sin in the church today. It's serious, deadly serious. And so I ask, does your life and testimony cause the unsaved to come under conviction? Is your Christianity a culturally acceptable, moralistic, psychological, feel-good deism? Only when we see sin as deep as hell can we ever experience and enjoy grace as high as heaven. The Apostle Paul would cry and speak of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Not just sin, but the exceeding sin, because he had seen Christ and him crucified. And he had determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. See, Paul never forgot the horrible pit of sin from which his Savior extracted him. He knew what it was to be convicted. He understood that he was the pattern of conversion down through the church ages. And so do you know the convicting work of God the Holy Spirit in your life? I will end it there. I'll just simply mention the other four foundation stones is the foundation stone of conversion. Conviction leads to conversion. And conversion leads to a confirmation. Oh, has it been confirmed in your heart? The Apostle Paul could say, I've seen the Lord. You see, I see him who is invisible. I see him with the eye of faith. I love someone I've never seen with these eyes. By faith. And then we'll look at the foundation stone of consignment or commission. You see, when we look at that passage in Acts, when Ananias went to the Apostle Paul, well, to, to Saul of Tarsus at that time, after he had seen the Lord, this is what he said. But the Lord said to him, go, in other words, go to, to Saul, for he is a chosen vessel to me. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you, you are a chosen vessel unto him. He says, he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name. God has chosen each one of us as a chosen vessel to bear his name. And then he says this, before Gentiles, kings, and, ch and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer. You say, well, that was the Apostle Paul. I mean, God called him to a special ministry, and he was called, and he was going to suffer many things, and we know from the rest of the book of Acts, and the epistles that Paul suffered tremendously, physically, mentally, emotionally, in every way, shape, and form, he suffered. But then he writes to the Philippians, as he would be writing to our church, for unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on his name, but also to suffer for his name's sake. He will write to Timothy and, and say to Timothy, be, because he has received the gift of, of the Holy Spirit, he tells Timothy not to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. He says, but share with me in the sufferings 
the sufferings that naturally come along with bearing witness. This is the Christian life. And it's not radical. It's not something strange I'm talking about. What I'm setting setting before each and every one of us are the simple ABCs of Christianity, the way I understand it in the scriptures, the simple ABCs. Have you been convicted? Have you been converted? Have you been commissioned? Have you been confirmed? And the last one is, have you been consecrated? Paul immediately went out and preached Christ. He consecrated himself to serve the Lord who saved him. Have you consecrated yourself? I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let those words ring in your ears. Next week, we'll look at the other four points of that moving on from the crucified mindset as we look at the surroundings that Paul was in. Almost identical to the surroundings we're in today. Let's bow and thank the Lord. And Lord, we do acknowledge uh, 